on today's episode, we are getting into the latest space news, including NASA worries Starship won't be ready to land on the moon, the ULA lights Vulcan's engines ahead of launch preparations, and scientists are searching for alien life by listening to the center of our galaxy. This is The Space Race. On June 7th, NASA Administrator Jim Free made comments that revealed his agency is fairly certain the SpaceX Starship vehicle will not be ready in time for the 2025 Artemis III missions to land on the moon. Jim's warning came while he was attending a joint meeting between the National Academy's Aeronautics and Space Engineering Board and Space Studies Board. The two entities met to discuss current and upcoming missions, and Artemis III was of course one of those discussed. The Artemis III mission is slated to be the first crewed landing on the lunar surface since Apollo 17 in 1972. NASA decided not to develop their own lander this time and outsourced the job to commercial companies, and while SpaceX won the original contract to provide the first lander, their Starship prototype is facing some difficulties. Everyone remembers the April 20th test launch of Starship and how it ended. SpaceX is still repairing their launch facilities and dealing with other fallout with the FAA and a lawsuit, but this is really just a small reason Jim Free is telling us to be prepared for the Artemis 3 launch date to slip into 2026. Sure, the damage was bad, and the FAA is going to have to deal with this suit before giving SpaceX the go-ahead to make a second attempt at launching their new super heavy lift vehicle, but first tests rarely go as planned. The real problem is the sheer amount of work that needs to get done before Starship is even approved for crewed missions, let alone landing a NASA astronaut team on the moon. First, they need to prove that they can launch the Starship without either blowing up the launch pad or shaking the booster apart with the vehicle's insane liftoff thrust. 7,500 tons of force is quite the hurdle, and that's before SpaceX starts using their new Raptor V3 engines, which could add another 1,000 tons of force to that. But SpaceX is putting a lot of solid work into making sure they can launch this beast, so the next issue is making sure it can orbit and deorbit in a controlled manner. Not that big of a deal once you get a rocket up there, so again, we can assume SpaceX won't have trouble here. But the next part is a huge milestone, refueling in orbit. SpaceX's plan is to launch the lander and refuel it in low Earth orbit with a couple of tanker Starship variants. The vehicles will have to hit tight orbital windows, intercept each other, dock, transfer cryogenic fuel, and detach safely, all automated. Now, SpaceX is anything but novice when it comes to operating in orbit. They send automated Cargo Dragon capsules to the ISS all the time without difficulty, but it's still a demonstration that needs to happen before NASA can sign off on the next leg of the mission, which is an uncrewed landing on the moon. And here's where SpaceX is going to face their biggest challenge. Again, automated landings on the moon are done all the time, but this isn't landing some small pod with scientific equipment on it. This is landing a multi-story rocket with very powerful engines on the moon, with no crew and no help from mission control. And then, it has to prove it can lift off and make it back into lunar orbit again. And all of those need to be completed before the proposed launch date of December 2025. So SpaceX is good, but no one's that good. Jim Free is not wrong to be worried about this insane amount of work and whether it can be done inside of about 18 months. We should also take a minute here to mention that Jim wasn't being critical of the SpaceX team. If anyone understands mission delays because of hardware issues, it's him. Realistically, it's likely that the Artemis program managers were expecting this sort of delay. There is a fair amount of wiggle room in the Artemis timeline to account for delays of several months. To be honest, it's probably what SpaceX engineers want as well. The team has been sprinting to get launch pad repairs and upgrades done, as well as manufacturing new variants of Starship and building their expanded star factory at Boca Chica. We haven't spotted definitive proof of any lander variants of Starship either. No verified parts or anything, let alone the small hop tests they will undoubtedly need to run to test their landing legs and liftoff systems before launching their lander into space. An extra year wouldn't just be prudent, 
it would give the engineers more time to avoid making mistakes from the stress of trying to keep such a tight deadline. And it's not like NASA won't be able to take advantage of the extra time. By 2026, the first modules of the Lunar Gateway Station could be up and running, making crew transfer from NASA's Orion capsule to the Starship lander way easier and maybe even the refueling process as well. It also gives the administration more time to make sure their communication systems are more supported before SpaceX takes a crew down to the moon's surface. NASA plans on adding more satellites to their cislunar network while the mainline Artemis missions operate, so extra time spent developing the Starship lander just means more communication satellites will be operational for them to use by 2026. It would have been amazing for SpaceX to have been able to hit that 2025 launch date, but that's not the reality of the space industry. Delays happen and safety is always the first and biggest consideration. If an extra year will make sure Starship has its best shot at a successful mission, then we can afford to wait out a bit longer. Besides, it's not like we won't have anything fun to watch. Think of all the testing we get to see. Good news for the United Launch Alliance last week as they finally managed to complete their flight readiness static fire of their new Vulcan Centaur rocket on June 7th, the last major milestone to hit before they can begin preparations for their first launch. The test firing wasn't overly different from other static fires we've seen before, the rocket's first stage booster was loaded onto the launch apparatus on Pad 41 at Cape Canaveral and filled with methane, liquid hydrogen, and liquid oxygen fuel. The vehicle was then put through a mock launch with a countdown clock helping the ground team run through flight checks and system procedures as though they intended to proceed with a launch. The difference being when the clock hit zero, the clamps stayed engaged while the twin BE-4 Blue Origin built engines were ignited burned and then shut down. A totally normal test. And that has to feel good for the Vulcan team after years of delays, mostly due to those Blue Origin engines. This test had been due to take place on May 25th after a test on May 12th cycled fuel into the Vulcan's tanks. But once the vehicle was back on the launch pad on May 25th, the ULA ground team found some issues with the ignition system of the BE-4 engines, and so the ULA was forced to roll their rocket back to the hangar for some repairs. That stung a little more than a malfunction like this should because it's these engines that have been stalling the Vulcan Centaur project more than anything else. On paper, the BE-4 is a solid engine, 250 tons of force at 134 bar of chamber pressure. It's not too different from a SpaceX Raptor V2 engine. The problem is that the ULA originally chose Blue Origin's engine for their first stage propulsion system, way back in 2018, with an expected launch date of 2020. Obviously, that didn't happen. BE-4 production and the testing done afterwards hit several speed bumps on its way to being cleared for use, and the ULA was forced to wait. Hardware development issues are common in any aerospace industry, so it's not surprising that the Vulcan was delayed, but since the ULA has become the US government's second favorite launch provider, the Vulcan team has been under a lot of pressure to get their vehicle up and running. That all being said, with Wednesday's test, it seems like everything is working smoothly. The first stage booster has been rolled back to the hangar for the usual inspection, but otherwise, the team is optimistic that we could see Vulcan's first launch this summer. The only thing standing in their way now is the final testing of the Centaur upper stage. Vulcan uses an upgraded version of the ULA Centaur vehicle for its upper stage. Currently, the company's Atlas V system makes use of a smaller Centaur upper stage, and testing of the newer, larger version has been on hold since a structural test back in March ended in an explosion. CEO Tori Bruno says that if more work needs to be done on the new Centaur upper stage, the first Vulcan flight could be delayed until later this year. That being said, I doubt the Vulcan team would be optimistic about a summer launch if they didn't have reason to expect a nominal test fire for their improved Centaur. The first launch is meant to take a payload Astrobotics Lunar Lander Peregrine. That's a pretty risky move for a first flight, but the ULA has a solid history of playing it safe, so I doubt they'd launch if they weren't confident of getting that lander all the way to the moon. The Vulcan is a solid rocket, strong engines, and a versatile framework allow it to be launched in a bunch of different configurations with different grades of solid fuel boosters depending on the weight of the payload. That sort of flexibility is what will hopefully make it a stellar workhorse. On May 31st, NASA conducted its first ever briefing on unidentified aerial phenomena. 
The public meeting was called to discuss the findings of an independent team commissioned in June of 2022 to study the rise in sightings of what used to be called UFOs. Their conclusion? The vast majority of sightings can't be verified because the data is coming from many different sources, collecting accounts in many different ways. And some sightings are classified, not because they show actual aliens, but because they show sensitive information about US military hardware. So while the answer is a little anticlimactic, the folks at the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence have found an exciting new way to find an alien civilization that we can actually verify. The day before the NASA conference, May 30th, a study was published in the Astronomical Journal written by researchers led by Akshay Suresh. The team had developed machine learning software that could detect a very particular type of repetitive signal, a train of pulses made in an extremely narrow frequency band about a tenth of the width of normal FM radio frequencies. This is because the study found that this type of efficient pulse is a very consistent way to communicate over interstellar distances. The pulses are unique and stand out from the background noise of the universe so well that it's easy to verify when this sort of signal is discovered. So easy, in fact, that we find them all the time. Pulsars, neutron stars that rotate so quickly that they emit regular beams of electromagnetic radiation into space. These beams are often found by scientists looking for intelligent life because the signals they produce are incredibly regular. Futuristic ideas about stellar navigation often cite pulsars as a good way of triangulating a ship's position anywhere in the galaxy. So how are they planning on weeding out pulsars from signals that could come from intelligent life? The team believes narrowing the search to the center of our galaxy should help with that. Some pulsars will likely be caught in the algorithm's net, but the center of the Milky Way has some of the galaxy's oldest stars in some of the densest areas, meaning that a species would have had more time to develop there, and being so close to neighboring star systems, they could feasibly have been communicating with another species, something we could overhear. It's not a perfect solution, but finding such a single reliable form of background radiation to test will make the search way easier. There might not be aliens visiting us, but there very well could be some hiding near the heart of our galaxy. Meet us back here every week for more updates on everything aerospace industry and interstellar exploration related. Make sure to give the video a thumbs up today if you liked it, that really helps us out for real. And subscribe to the Space Race for more videos just like this. We do one long form essay and one news update every week. And if you'd like more, we've got two more on the screen for you right now.